Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome back to chapter one. We're talking about life. We're talking about the basic principles of life. Uh, life interacts with its environment. Um, life has to exchange uh, matter and energy. We take in matter when we eat food. We take in matter when we breathe in. We release matter when we pee, when we poop, when we breathe out. We take in energy uh, by eating food. We release energy by making body heat. Life interacts with the environment, exchanging matter and energy with the environment. Taking in matter, taking in energy, releasing matter, releasing energy. Um, life interacts with the environment. Uh, the environment is other organisms. Uh, I mean, if you go and catch a fish and then eat it, that's interacting with your environment. Uh, we interact with the physical factors. If we go and we uh, get a cup of water out of the stream, um, that is interacting with your environment. Most ecosystems will have at least two different groups of organisms. The first group you always have to have in every ecosystem is a producer. Uh, producers are what make food from non-living sources. Example, plants. Plants take water from the ground, carbon dioxide from the air, and energy in the form of light from the sun. Plants take those three things, carbon dioxide, water, and energy, and they make this stuff that we call sugar. They make this stuff that we call glucose. They then use that sugar to build their bodies. They then use that sugar to make fruits. They then use that sugar to feed themselves. That is a producer. Now imagine that a tree lives and grows its whole life and never gets chewed on by an animal. And that tree falls over. A bunch of nutrients, a bunch of um, uh, vitamins, a bunch of molecules are trapped now within the body of this tree. So for those molecules to be recycled, that body has to be broken down. So the second class, the second group of organisms that every ecosystem needs is a decomposer. Decomposers are recyclers. They take these trapped resources and the dead bodies of uh, formerly living things. They break them down to recycle them into the soil so that those nutrients can be used over again. Every ecosystem has to have at least uh, producers and decomposers. Most ecosystems also have uh, consumers. Uh, that tree that lived its whole life without getting munched on by an animal, is that a very realistic scenario? Not really. I mean, you can go out and walk through the forest and you can see holes in leaves or bugs have eaten. You can see um, uh, half-eaten pears underneath of a tree. You can see half-eaten uh, pecans underneath the trees where squirrels have come and chewed on them. And we know, we know that animals are constantly eating at plants. And Animals are consumers. Um, animals aren't the only consumers. There are others, but animals are the primary consumers. So, most ecosystems have three different classes of organisms. Producers, making all the food. Consumers, eating the producers. And then decomposers, which are recycling all of the waste products back into the ecosystem to keep it running. We have plants, which are the producers. Energy comes in. They take in chemical. Uh, they take in carbon dioxide from the air, water from the ground, and they make food. Did the plant make the food for the moose? Who did the plant make the food for? The plant made the food for themselves. The moose is stealing it. Plants are the producers, animals are consumers. Um, we always have decomposers. Decomposers such as worms, fungi, bacteria, they'll return these nutrients back into the soil so that plants can pull them back up out of the ground. Uh, you've probably heard of like plant food, like miracle Grow, right? Well, it's not food. Plants don't eat from the soil. They take nutrients. Their miracle Grow and stuff like that, that's more plant vitamins. It's not food food that they need, it's resources that they need so they can keep making food. Because they make food from sunlight, from water, and from 
the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. Energy comes in from the sun, energy goes out as heat. All living things use DNA as their basic code. All living things use DNA as the code of instructions for um, all of the products that they need to make, all of the proteins that any kind of cell um, is going to make, it has to have a set of instructions for, and those instructions are held in DNA. Um, all cells have genes. Genes are made of DNA. Let's, let's talk about this, because you've heard the term DNA. You've heard the term genes. You've heard the term chromosomes before. But what do they all mean? What's their relationship? How do they all work together? Do you know what DNA and genes and chromosomes are? Let's start in the middle because that's the easiest one to understand. A gene is a single set of instructions. A gene is a single recipe. Because a recipe is a set of instructions, right? That tells you how much of something to put together with how much of something else. And then if you follow the directions, you put the things together in the right order, then you end up with a product that you want. You end up with a pecan pie. You end up with a sugar cookie. You end up with meatloaf. You put the things together that you're supposed to put together in the right amounts, in the right order, and then I get a product that I'm trying to make. The gene is the recipe. Where are recipes held? Where do you find recipes? Online. Yes. But where, traditionally, do people find, did people find recipes? They were in recipe books. And how many recipes are in any one book? And the answer is a lot. And do those recipes necessarily have anything to do with one another? Not really. I mean, you go to the section for main dishes, you go to the section for hot dishes, you go to the section for side dishes, you go to the section for baking, you go to the section for desserts. There's all kinds of different recipes. So the recipes don't necessarily have to be related to each other. A gene is a single recipe. A chromosome is a recipe book. A chromosome is a collection of genes, a whole volume of genes. And in your mom's kitchen, in your kitchen, how many recipe books do you have? Do you just have one, or do you have many? You have many. You have many chromosomes. You have many recipe books. And each chromosome has hundreds or even perhaps thousands of genes on them. What code is used to write the recipe? The code is words, letters. The recipe is written in English, or whatever language yours is written in. The code is the words, and you have to decipher, you have to decode the recipe. We've been reading since we were in elementary school, and so reading a recipe is not that big of a deal. It's something that's very easy to do. But if someone were to give you a recipe book in Russian, or in Japanese, or in... Chinese, whatever, you wouldn't have the first clue as to what to do with it. It would be useless to you because you don't know the code. In English, you do know the code. DNA is the code that the recipe is written in. DNA is the code that I use to write a recipe. A recipe is a set of instructions. Whole bunches of recipes are grouped together in recipe books. DNA is the code, the gene is a recipe, a chromosome is a recipe book. All genes are made of DNA. It is the job of a gene is to transmit instructions from one... It, the job of a gene is to be used in an individual, and genes are transmitted from parent to child. Um, some of you may have gotten recipe books from your mother, from your grandmother. My wife has a treasured recipe book that she got from her grandmother, written in her grandmother's handwriting. Um, you get your recipes, you get your genes from your parents. Um, as we said, groups of genes are called chromosomes, 
And uh, these genes control all cellular activities. Think about it. Think about a kitchen, like a, a professional kitchen, like, you know, a, a kitchen in a restaurant. The recipes that they're using that day, if they only put out a certain set of recipes, then that's all they're making that day. And if they only have the ingredients for making spaghetti and lasagna and pizza, then that's all they're going to make. And so they have the recipes up for spaghetti, for lasagna, and for pizza. And if those are the only recipes they have, then that's the only thing that's getting made. The genes that are open or available to a cell decides, determines what that cell can make. Just like the recipes that you have in your kitchen decide what you can make.